The FSR is our annual assessment of the key vulnerabilities of and the risks to the Canadian financial system. Our goal in identifying these is to help households, the private sector, financial authorities and governments take actions to reduce them. We've just come through the biggest, and I hope the biggest we ever face, shock. Uh, two years of an unprecedented pandemic, economic and social upheaval. We're pleased to report that our financial system is strong and weathered the crisis well. Now the global economy is dealing with a new set of challenges. High inflation, rising interest rates, Russia's unprovoked invasion of the Ukraine, and financial market vulnerability. So it's a good time to discuss existing and emerging vulnerabilities and risks. Dans presque tous les RCF, on parle de l'endettement élevé des ménages canadiens et des prix élevés des logements. Ces vulnérabilités ne sont pas nouvelles, mais elles ont été touchées par la pandémie. Durant la pandémie, le bilan des ménages a évolué à mesure que les dépenses et les revenus se sont ajustés. En moyenne, la richesse des ménages a augmenté. C'est en raison de la valeur accrue des actifs, dont l'immobilier, et de fortes hausses de l'épargne. Cette amélioration, surtout du côté de l'épargne, est remarquable, vu des dégâts de la pandémie auraient pu causer. Mais pour évaluer les vulnérabilités, il faut regarder au-delà de la moyenne et examiner comment le bilan des ménages a évolué. En effet, la situation financière des ménages moyennes s'est améliorée. Mais plus de Canadiennes se sont surendettées pour acheter une maison pendant la pandémie. Ils sont donc plus exposés aux hausses de taux d'intérêt et à la baisse potentielle des prix des logements. Two-thirds of Canadians are homeowners. Just under half own their home outright, and the rest have a mortgage. Of those, 70% have a fixed rate mortgage that is not immediately affected by higher interest rates. The other 30% or 10% of Canadians have a variable rate mortgage. Throughout the pandemic, a growing number of Canadians took out mortgages that were very large relative to their incomes at variable rates with amortizations of more than 25 years. And our model suggests that the most highly indebted households saw only a small increase in their liquid assets in that time. This brings me to our second and related vulnerability, elevated house prices. Strong demand for more living space, low interest rates, inadequate supply, increased investor activity, and expectations of future increases all made for a hot market during the pandemic. House prices rose about 50% on average since the beginning of the pandemic. As Canadians return to more normal activities and interest rates rise, we expect to see some moderation in the housing market. Indeed, this has started. Recent data indicate a marked decline in the level of resale activity from its peak. And even if house prices are up sharply on a year-over-year -year basis, some markets have recently seen declines. With inflation well above the 2% target and, Canadian, and the Canadian economy overheating, the bank's number one priority is to get inflation back to target. And we are raising interest rates to make that happen. Labor markets are very strong and household balance sheets have improved overall. The economy can handle, indeed needs, higher interest rates. And given the unsustainable strength of housing activity, some moderation in housing would be healthy. But high household debt and elevated house prices are vulnerabilities. If the economy slowed sharply and unemployment rose considerably, the combination of more highly indebted Canadians and high house prices could amplify the downturn. If those highly indebted households lose their jobs, they would likely need to reduce their spending sharply to continue servicing their mortgage. In addition, a big correction in house prices would reduce both household wealth and access to credit, particularly among the most indebted households. Were this to affect many households, it could have broader implications for the economy and the financial system. This is not what we expect to happen. Our goal is for a soft landing with inflation coming back to the 2% target, but it is a vulnerability to watch closely and manage carefully. Let me now turn to Carolyn to address three global vulnerabilities outlined in the FSR. 
final set of vulnerabilities described in our FSR has been highlighted by the war in Ukraine and other geopolitical tensions, and some risks are rising. Events over the past year have emphasized the interconnected nature of the global financial system. Russia's invasion of Ukraine has increased our concern about cybersecurity. Globally, state-sponsored cyber attacks have increased in frequency and sophistication since the war in Ukraine began. That, increase, that increases the risk of, attack, of an attack on a Canadian bank or other financial institution or our financial market infrastructure. And given the interconnected nature of financial markets, the impact of a successful cyber attack on one institution could spread to the broader financial system. The war has also further added to the level of uncertainty around the transition to a low carbon economy. In the short term, it threatens global energy security, increasing the dependence on higher emitting fossil fuels like coal and risks slowing the transition. Over the medium term, transition uncertainty means that assets exposed to the fossil fuel sector, including those found in the pension funds and retirement savings of many Canadians, are at risk of a large and rapid repricing. We need better transparency about climate exposures by businesses and financial institutions. We also need clear transition plans by global policymakers. Together, these can help mitigate the risks of a disorderly and painful transition that hurts both our financial system and our economy. Finally, crypto assets are a growing vulnerability. More Canadians are investing in crypto assets, but the growth of these markets has outpaced global efforts to regulate them. Like other speculative assets, cryptocurrencies are vulnerable to large and sudden price declines. And recently, some stable coins, a type of cryptocurrency, have failed to deliver on their promise of stability. While crypto assets do not yet pose a systemic risk to the Canadian financial system, the lack of regulation means they don't have the safeguards that exist for more traditional financial assets. And their risks may not be well understood by investors. Regulators around the world and in Canada have recognized this risk and are working to address it. Let me conclude by underlining that the vulnerabilities are best thought of as weaknesses in the financial system. In normal times, they may not have much impact, but large shocks can cause much more economic and financial damage when vulnerabilities amplify their effects. We've summarized the main vulnerabilities that are highlighted in the FSR. The report also outlines what's being done to mitigate them and to develop contingency plans because even the best planning cannot eliminate risk. It's a very comprehensive report and offers just a snapshot of the work that we do on financial stability all year long. The Governor and I will now be happy to take your questions. Thank you, Governor Macklem, Senior Deputy Governor Rogers. We will go to questions now, beginning here in Ottawa. I've got five people on the list to start. If uh, you're not on the list, uh, just flag me down. Uh, we'll begin with Eric Hertzberg from Bloomberg, please. Good morning, thanks for taking our questions. Uh, given the vulnerabilities that are flagged in this, uh, this report and review, I'm, I'm wondering if you could give us your insight on whether or not households could handle a larger magnitude interest rate hike uh, in coming months, larger than 50 basis points. Uh, well, let me, uh, let me go back and just review a few uh, our, our recent monetary policy decisions. For some time, we have indicated that with inflation well above our target, with the economy overheating, uh, we want to get our policy interest rate uh, back into the neutral range uh, quickly. Uh, and we've indicated we think that range is between 2 and 3%. Uh, we think the economy can handle higher interest rates. We think the economy needs higher interest rates. Uh, at our last decision, we indicated that uh, we were prepared to move more forcefully if needed. And last week, uh, Deputy Governor Paul Beaudry also uh, indicated that uh, given that inflation uh, looks like it's going to go higher before it eases, given that inflation has been broadening and the economy is overheating, 
the likelihood that we may need to go to the top of that 2 to 3 percent neutral range or possibly somewhat above it to bring inflation back to target has increased. So when we indicate that uh, we're prepared to move more forcefully if needed, what we're indicating is uh, we, we may, may need to take more steps, more interest rate steps uh, to get inflation back to target. Uh, or we may need to move more quickly, may need to take uh, a larger step. Uh, so, I mean, those decisions will be taken uh, based on incoming data and importantly, based on our assessment of the dynamics for inflation and our outlook for inflation. Uh, and and uh, you know, the economy is strong. Uh, we certainly think it can handle uh, higher interest rates and we are very focused on getting inflation back to target and we're gonna do what's needed to achieve that objective. Eric, did you have a follow-up? Okay, thank you. Uh, our next questioner would be uh, Paul Vieira from Wall Street Journal. Uh, Jones, Paul. Uh, Governor, the, the report says it's too early to make a judgment about whether um, the decline in um, housing activity is temporary or a prolonged correction. What factors are causing you to um, what factors are causing you to hold judgment and not say that a correction or a steep decline in prices is coming? Um, well, first of all, just let me underline that you know, uh, you know our our primary focus is uh, getting inflation back to target. Uh, you know, monetary policy is not housing policy. Um, but that, the housing market, it's an important part of our economy, and we're certainly watching the dynamics closely in, in the housing market. I mean, overall, we need to slow demand in the economy and bring it in line with, the, with supply. The housing market has been unsustainably strong. Uh, the level of activity, the increases in housing prices we've seen have been uh, un unsustainably elevated. Uh, and we are expecting to see uh, some moderation in, in housing activity, and frankly, uh, that, that, would be, that would be healthy. The economy is overheating, uh, and, and that is certainly uh, part of the story. Um, looking at the dynamics of housing, I mean, we've been talking about high interest rates for some time. That may have pulled forward some of the, of the activity in housing, so uh, that could be a factor playing into the slowing. Um, there are certainly some underlying uh, strength in, in the market. Uh, employment is very strong. Wages are going up. Immigration is rebounding. There, there are underlying factor, underlying uh, demand factors that will be supporting the market. Uh, on the other hand, we have seen uh, you know a big boost in activity, and so it wouldn't be surprising to see some moderation. Um. You you said um, you you've said in the opening statement that a moderation in pricing would be healthy. Um, is this to say that you're prepared to um, sacrifice um, growth in housing in order to get to um, get to uh, two percent inflation? The, the, look, Paul, the the economy is overheating. Um, you know, you look at you look at our labor market. Uh, we've got almost a million vacancies uh, in the labor market. Um, the economy is in excess demand. Uh, we, need, we, we need higher interest rates to take out the excess in excess demand, bring demand back into supply uh, to get inflation down. Part of that adjustment will no doubt come through the housing market. Um, that's part of getting inflation back to target. We'll go now to uh, Greg Quinn for Market News, please. Hello. Um, the, there was a survey of major investors along with this report, um, and it showed a bit of an asymmetric concern about the, the potential for the Bank of Canada to over-tighten policy in a way that could be destabilizing as opposed to the risk of maybe being too passive and having to do more later. I wonder what, what you make of this, if you sh share that sentiment, or wh what you feel the message is from the big investors there. Um, well, there, there's a few key messages from the surveys. One is uh, there is considerable confidence in the resilience of the financial system. Um, there, you know, the, the 
you know, we're, we're going through now a period of adjustment. We've, uh, we've come out of a very deep hole. We've had a remarkable recovery. I think that is, that has, is a source of confidence, but we've got some new challenges. Uh, inflation's too high. Monetary policy in Canada and in most major countries uh, is tightening. Uh, and you know, our objective is very much to, to uh, achieve a soft landing with inflation coming back to target, but it is going to be delicate and there are risks around that and I think that's reflected in uh, those survey results. Um, uh, secondly, I, I, in, inflation seems likely to accelerate a, a bit more in, in the near term. You know, Statistics Candace is folding in uh, used car prices for, for as one element, um, but interest rate hikes take time to work their way through the full economy. So how, how, how do you keep a lid on inflation expectations and financial market stability in, in the meantime until all that, that uh, stimulus is removed? Uh, well, you're, you're, you're focusing a little more on monetary policy. I hope we can get back to the uh, financial stability review, but, but it, is, it is a very important question. Uh, and certainly the lesson from history is that uh, if inflation expectations become unmoored, uh, we will need to sh slow the economy. We will likely need to slow the economy much more to get inflation back to target. So we are very focused on keeping inflation expectations uh, well anchored uh, on the target. And, and uh, as we highlighted in our decision last week, uh, with inflation well above our target, with uh, the expectation that it's going to rise further before starting to ease, the risk that higher inflation expectations become embedded has increased. So, so what do you do about this? I think the important things that we're doing is we're being very clear about our objective. Uh, we are very clear our number one priority is to get inflation back to target. And we've been very clear with Canadians that they should expect a rising path for interest rates to moderate demand and bring it uh, in line with supply. And I think you know what, what we know is that the more Canadians understand about monetary policy, uh, the more they uh, understand how it works, the more confidence they have in, in how it's working. So we have been, I think, unusually clear with Canadians that they should expect a rising path for interest rates to bring inflation back to target, and that's our primary focus. Our next questioner will be Julie Gordon from Reuters, please. Julie. Hello, thanks for taking our questions. Um, you know, I'll, I'll start off with the FSR for you. Um, you say, if I'm paraphrasing correctly, that you don't expect a big house price correction would affect many households, but it's a vulnerability and needs to be managed carefully. How are you managing that risk as you increase interest rates? Uh, I, I think uh, I, I'll ask uh, Senior Deputy Governor Rogers to take this question. Yes, thanks, Governor. Thanks for the question, Julie. I mean, as we point out in the financial stability review, um, uh, there is a small portion of uh, Canadians who have uh, entered the housing market recently, and they have had to stretch to do so given the, the, the high um, level of house prices. So those are all the households that are vulnerable to both to increases in interest rates and also changes in their income. Um, I think the, the, the answer to your question about what we're doing is we're, we're doing exactly what the governor just described. We're being very clear to Canadians about our objective, that we're focused um, on bringing down demand back into balance with supply. And the way that we do that is we increase interest rates. Thank you. And then for a follow up, I'll take you back to uh, Eric's question. Um, you, you know, you mentioned. The, the more forcefully can mean taking more steps. It can be moving more quickly and also making a, a larger single move, the larger than 50 basis point move. Um, what factors play in to the decision on which path you are going to take? The, the, the most important factor really is the outlook for inflation. We are going to be looking uh, importantly at the dynamics of inflation, uh, the state of the economy, to what extent are the increases of interest rates we've done are, are starting to have an impact? Uh, and importantly, how quickly we think inflation will come back to target. And what we've indicated is that if, uh, if we need to act more forcefully to bring inflation back to target, we're prepared to do so. 
Okay, Catherine Collin from CBC, please. Hello there, Governor. Um, I'm sure you were listening with great interest when Pierre Polyev said that he was going to fire you. Um, he has said that you had one job, you have one job to keep prices stable and inflation low, and that a welder, a barber, a waitress would be fired if they didn't do their job. Is that a fair criticism? I'm going to leave politics to the politicians. Uh, we have a job to do for Canadians, and we are not going to sleep easy until Canadians can stop worrying about inflation, and that is my primary focus. What I will say is that I take my role very seriously as the leader of a public institution of more than a thousand professionals that's working very hard to deliver for Canadians. We, we welcome diverse views. We welcome analysis, we welcome criticism of our work and of our decisions. Uh, we're doing that ourselves. Uh, look, inflation is too high. Uh, Canadians should be asking us tough questions. Uh, and we, we've been very clear on our objective. Uh, we are focused on getting inflation back to target. Uh, and um, I am confident that we will deliver on our objective. Uh, getting back to the previous questions, uh, we've been very clear we need to get the neutral rate at least up to, we need to get our policy rate at least up to neutral, uh, possibly uh, slightly above to bring inflation back to target. Uh, I'm confident that will work and uh, we are, we're very focused on getting inflation, uh, on delivering our, our mandate. He has attacked the independence of the bank, suggesting that you uh, are connected to Justin Trudeau. And, I, and I am ge I'm genuinely curious, sir, to what extent you feel you are able to defend yourself and this institution from that kind of political attack, if your position allows for it. What I can say is that uh, all the actions we've taken through this pandemic have been entirely focused on fulfilling our mandate. At the start of this pandemic, uh, financial markets were frozen. Uh, and one of the core roles of a central bank is to provide liquidity in the event of a crisis against good collateral. We did that in scale. Uh, it worked. Financial markets unfroze relatively quickly. That is key to making sure that a much worse, you know, very deep recession didn't become a depression. It was key to making sure credit kept flowing so Canadians uh, could get access to credit, uh, businesses could fund their operations. Um, we also provided uh, exceptional monetary policy support uh, to put a floor under uh, what was the deepest recession we've ever had and to support the recovery. And it worked together with fiscal policy, together with very effective vaccines, uh, and, and together, frankly, with the ingenuity and adaptability of Canadians and Canadian businesses. Uh, it worked. The Canadian economy has recovered. We've now got some new challenges. Uh, there's Inflation is too high. Uh, there are global supply constraints. There's a war in Ukraine. Our economy is overheating. Um, there's, there's a second part to this. Uh, and we need to complete the job. We need to get inflation back to target. And we're very focused on doing that. Okay. Um, well, we do have one more here. Yeah. Okay. Mackenzie Gray, CTV, please. Uh, Governor, further to, Catherine's, uh, further to Catherine's question, Mr. Polyev's argument is that the bank has bungled inflation so badly that you should be removed and that anyone else who would have such a, a mistake in their job would be removed. Why should the bank be held to a different standard than uh, other Canadians? I don't think the bank is held to a different standard. I think we are very focused on doing our job. Uh, and uh, I am confident we will deliver for Canadians. Do you think it's appropriate he's called for your removal? As I said, I'm going to leave politics to the politicians. I'm going to focus. Uh, everyone at the Bank of Canada is very focused on what we need to do to deliver for Canadians. Okay, we're going to go to Toronto now, and I have three names on the list in Toronto. The first would be Mark Rendell from the Globe and Mail. So Toronto, if you're ready, Mark, please go ahead. Hi there, are you able to hear me? Yes, yes, Mark. Thank you very much for taking the question. In terms of the ability to, to act forcefully and get the interest rate policy rate up to the neutral range at the top end, how much does the fact that housing markets are 
more indebted, households are more indebted, housing markets are more elevated than before. How much does that limit your ability to act forcefully, to act on inflation, and to hit that neutral range or a high end neutral range? Well, Mark, as we've highlighted in this financial stability report, um, there are two cross currents here. Uh, on the one hand, households have come through this pandemic with actually balance sheets in better shape. Uh, as we've highlighted many times, um, households have saved a lot more during the pandemic. They've been unable to, to buy, consume any of the services in particular that they wanted to consume. Uh, and so they've, they've saved uh, more than normal. Um, at an aggregate level, it's something like $200 billion of ex excess savings so-called excess savings, extra savings during the pandemic, that's about $8,000 per household. Uh, in addition, uh, for homeowners, uh, they've seen a substantial appreciation in the value of their homes. So, so on average, uh, the balance sheets of Canadians are stronger. Uh, in that sense, um, that provides more of a buffer to higher interest rates. Uh, the other part, though, that we highlight is that uh, there is a segment of Canadians, uh, and, and, and indeed more Canadians, through the pandemic stretched to buy homes. Uh, they took on mortgages that had a higher uh, high um, loan-to-income ratio, and you've seen an increase in high loan-to-income ratio mortgages, which we define as, as mortgages uh, with that ratio is over 450%. That was running about 15 to 20 percent of mortgages before the pandemic it's now a little over 25 percent of mortgages so there are more canadians that have stretched uh, and they will be more sensitive to interest rates so as we're raising interest rates we are watching uh the the impacts uh, and you do have to distinguish between the average and the impacts on on certain segments of the population and see how that all weighs out um, you know, the housing market it's an important part of the economy we are watching it closely but our focus ultimately is on the whole economy and in getting inflation back to target and as i said earlier um, we think the economy needs higher interest rates and in, and it can certainly handle higher interest rates thanks a uh, quick follow-up you, you think the goal uh, of raising rates right now is is getting inflation down and trying to hit that soft landing. I, I understand soft landing means not a recession, but how willing are you to engineer a recession if it's needed to get back to the 2% inflation target? Sorry, I didn't quite catch the end. It was a little muffled. Can you say it again, Mark? How willing is the bank to engineer a recession if you believe that is what is needed to get to the 2% inflation target? Uh, so our mandate's very clear. Our primary responsibility is price stability, and we are focused on getting inflation back to target. Uh, we want to do this in the best way possible. Uh, you know, the economy is overheating. Uh, we need to, to bring demand better in, into balance and supply uh, to bring inflation back to target. But we don't want to overcool the economy. Uh, our own forecast has a soft landing. Most most other people's forecast has a soft landing. And I think there are some good reasons why uh, that is achievable. Much of the inflation we are experiencing uh, is coming from international uh, sources, higher oil prices, higher food prices. Uh, at some point, those prices will stop increasing and those international sources of inflation will abate. And provided we've kept inflation expectations well anchored, uh, inflation should those international that international inflation should come down and then domestically we've got to bring demand uh we, we need to bring demand uh in line with supply we don't want to choke off demand we want to get rid of the excess demand the excess part of it i mean in the labor market we've got almost uh, twice as many vacancies today as we had before the pandemic uh, we need to dampen the demand for labor and get rid of those vacancies not people put people out of work Having said that, uh, it is going to be delicate. Uh, there are uh, risks here. Uh, an important element, as I've stressed before, is keeping inflation expectations well anchored. Uh, and uh, that's why we've been very clear with Canadians. 
If we can keep inflation expectations well anchored, it will be easier to get inflation back to target. And by moving interest rates up uh, reasonably quickly, uh, our hope is that we can avoid the need for a sharper slowdown to get inflation back to target. Okay, we'll stay in Toronto now, and our next questioner is Ian Bickus from Canadian Press. Go ahead, please, Ian. Thanks for taking my question. So, in terms of reducing inflation, uh, you, before you highlight the vulnerabilities of households, uh, the high debt levels, and the potential loss of equity if the housing prices retreat, but I guess I'm curious how much can the housing market retreat before it affects your ability to, to raise rates? I'm, I'm going to ask Senior Deputy Governor. Uh, Rogers to take that one. It was a little muffled, so I hope we... Hope yeah, we so I'm going to ask you just to repeat the very end of the question, because I don't think I quite heard it. Sure, but yeah, you just how much can the housing market retreat before it affects your ability to raise rates? Okay, well, um, I think we've, we've answered this question a few times now. I mean, the, the, an important thing to remember is that we set uh, uh, monetary policy for the whole of the economy. Um, certainly, the housing sector is an important part of that economy. It's one of the parts of the economy that is uh, most sensitive to interest rate changes. We know that. Uh, the FSR clearly points out, um, as the governor said, the, the sort of cross-section of the risk of high housing prices and uh, households who um, have higher debt levels, particularly if they've gotten into the housing market recently. These are all things that we pay very close attention to both for our, in our role as monitoring financial stability and in our role as setting monetary policy. But again, you know, our number one um, objective is, is inflation. Um, and that's what we're focused on. We're focused on returning inflation to target. We will watch the housing market closely, but we set uh, monetary policy for the whole of the Canadian economy. And then just uh, you highlight that it's a, you caught, every year you highlight the independence of Canadians and how it, it's actually been increasing. What needs to be done long term to, to address household indebtedness and why it hasn't been done yet? Household indebtedness um, has has been a vulnerability in Canada for a while now. The, if you go back in time and look at the uh, bank's previous FSRs, uh, this is uh, this is something that we have pointed to in previous FSRs. The most important thing that the bank can do right now to support a healthy economy and to support Canadians is to get inflation back to target, and and that's what we're going to do. Okay, staying in Toronto for Stephanie Hughes of the Financial Post, please. Hello, uh, thank you for taking my question. Um, I understand that uh, you uh, highlighted that uh, the monetary policy is focusing on the broader macroeconomic picture, but I want to um, focus in on the uh, larger mortgage costs with rising rates for uh, homeowners who bought during the pandemic. Uh, how concerned is the bank on how stretched households uh, could put a drag on economic consumption moving forward and is there concern over increase in delinquencies among these uh, recent buyers? Uh, well, a, a couple of things. Um, and this relates to some of the previous questions as well. Um, I mean, a number of actions were taken, uh, you know, as Senior Deputy Governor just indicated, high high uh, household debt has been a vulnerability for some time. And a number of actions have been taken on the part of the Office of the Superintendent of Financial Institutions and the Government of Canada to mitigate that risk. And an important one uh, through the pandemic was to put a floor, um, a minimum qualifying floor as part of the B20 stress test. Uh, so a floor was put at five and uh, a quarter, 5.25%. Uh, uh, so that uh, in order to get a mortgage, even though interest rates were way below that, you had to qualify at that higher rate. The reason to put the floor in was really in recognition that during the pandemic, interest rates were exceptionally low. They weren't going to stay that low. They only had one way to go. Uh, eventually, they had to go up. And recognizing that, um, the B20 stress tests ensured that when people qualified for mortgages, they had they had some space, they had some headroom. Now that doesn't mean, you know, as those calculations you referred to highlight, that doesn't mean that higher interest rates aren't going to impact the budgets of Canadians. They are. Uh, but 
um, and, and those illustrative calculations give you a sense of, of uh, the magnitudes for average Canadian based on uh, the, ex the, um, the market's expected path for interest rates. Um, but the, the, the idea of the B20 stress test was that, that uh, those the, the, the households had some room. They, the, those were manageable reductions. Uh, when that cost went up, they could manage it. Yes, they will have to cut back other parts of their spending, that's partly how monetary policy works. We need to bring spending in the economy overall in line with demand uh, to get inflation back to target. Questions for me? Nothing further? Okay. Um, maintenant, à Montréal, si je comprends bien, il n'y a pas de question à Montréal. C'est correct? C'est effectivement le cas. Il n'y a pas de question à Montréal. Okay, merci, Sean. Uh, okay, in that case, we're going to go to the phones now, and we have, I believe, Tony Mace from Mace News. Please go ahead. Hi, well, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, perhaps this is a question for the senior deputy governor. Your report says um, fixed income markets remain vulnerable to a spike in demand for liquidity um, or a possible freeze in the bond market has occurred in March of 2020. In terms of market structure and regulation, I mean, what, have, what has the bank done to address this problem in the intervening period and, and what remains to be done to um, support fixed income market making during time of stress? Thank you. So one of the important things that the, the bank does um, to support policy making in this area is exactly the report that we're here to talk about today. Um, uh, we point out uh, we, we've done a, num uh, a lot of research and anal analytics in this area, and and we've made that available to policymakers. The bank also participates in a number of forums uh, domestically and internationally looking at this issue. Um, uh, they're outlined in the FSR. Um, and in, in some cases, they, they've made clear policy proposals. Um, uh, those proposals are for uh, regulators to implement, and we'll continue to work with our, our partners, both domestically and globally, in this area. If I could just, just follow up, please. Um, I mean, the report mentions that there may be, um, there may have been a decrease in the willingness of banks to supply liquidity to financial markets. I mean, how do you measure this, or, or what are the signs that uh, liquidity is, is down? Thank you. Uh, so, the report points out a, a number of analytical um, tools we use to look at this. Uh, it is true that uh, regulatory standards for banks have affected their willingness um, or ability. Um, to make markets to provide liquidity. Um, other providers of liquidity have stepped in. Um, this is something we'll be monitoring closely. Um, I'll leave it at that. Okay, we've been around the horn um, and everybody's had an opportunity. I'm just glancing across and I'm not seeing anyone here uh, as well. And I'm hearing from Toronto that we're good. So at that point, in that case, we're going to wrap it up. That will conclude today's press conference. Thank you very much, Governor, Senior Deputy Governor. Thanks uh, for everybody for attending, and uh, we'll see you next time.